Scott County, providing safe, healthy, and livable communities. Move on to item 5.1, which is to receive information on the Scott County Delivers topic, clean water and soil protection efforts. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Okay, good. So we are here today to talk about clean soil, water, and air. And we were last here in 2019. And so this group is gonna talk a little bit about their work and some of the progress that's been made and some of the changes that have happened since that time. You know, you hear it from people every day that, that clean water, clean soil, our environment is such an appreciated part of living in Scott County for so many of the people that we, um, that live here. And um, the piece that I think has been really interesting to talk with this group about as we prepared for this is the amount of effort and um, strategy they put into engaging people and working to protect the environment with them. Um, and that so much of their work is cooperative with landowners um, and, and a, a declining percentage of, of it requires any kind of cohesive, no, coercive um, kind of effort. So we have really a, um, a, a knowledgeable panel today. I'm gonna to ask those folks to introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, but I did want to just remind you of where we were in 2019. So in 2019, part of the title of our presentation was around mitigating flood damage. Um, this year, we are not talking about flood damage. Um, so that brings into call the question of um, what are we seeing from these extreme weather um, patterns and, and how does our environment react to that? How do we support that? Uh, we were talking about arsenic. Arsenic had just been identified in a small section of the county in 2019. So this group is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and we'll get some updates on the status of that work. So with that, I'd like to start by asking um, my co-facilitator to present himself. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Scott Haas. I'm the director of emergency management and 911 communications. Thank you. And then I'd like the panel to introduce themselves. I, I'm just gonna go down the list on the on the narrative. So Brad. Yeah, Brad Davis, Director of Planning and Resource Management. Kate. Good morning, I'm Kate Logic, Environmental Services Manager. Vanessa. Good morning, I'm Vanessa Strong. I'm the Water Resources Supervisor. Uh, Megan. Megan Tasca, uh, the County's Water Resources Engineer. <laughs> Sorry, Megan. <laughs> I'm Debbie Megan, Megan Darley, Scott's and Water Conservation District Natural Resource Specialist. Thank you. Um, Melissa? Uh, Melissa Bachman Armour, Senior Water Resources Planner. Good Chair, Commissioners, uh, Chris and Scott, good morning. Thanks for having us. I'm Ryan Holzer, uh, Water Resources Scientist. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this today. Uh, and if it's all right with you, Scott, I'm going to start out. Um, I'd like to go, I, this was actually a follow up to a conversation that we've had uh, previously. Um, looking at the very first data slide, um, which is a measure, a community indicator for the number of the days that air quality was considered good in Scott County. <clears throat> and um, I presented this data earlier this year and um, one of the commissioners asked, what does it mean that the percentages of those days is declining? So I'd like to throw that out to the group uh, to give some reaction to what our understanding of is why this data is changing. Good morning, this is Kate. So I will, um talk to this slide a little bit here. So what you're looking at is, um, so what this what the state does is they use the air quality index to take a look at um, overall how um, Minnesota is doing. Um, and you're looking at the number, the percent of days in the year that were good. And overall, when you're in the 80s and 90s, we're doing, um, which is the highest quality category overall, Minnesota, um, and um, the South Metro area, our area is doing very well. But it is declining just a little bit, um, nothing to be too concerned about. Um, I did reach out to uh, the MPCA and um, just kind of uh, talked with them about the data a little bit. 
and what was happening. And they said, well, this is really a reflection of those wildfires that happened in Canada. Um, the wildfires around us do impact us, and it kind of has a lot to do with the conditions, meteorology, meteorology and, and climate, you know, if there's a front coming in and, and so on. So if those all play together. Um, they're, they're saying overall um, in our area, we're still doing well, but that's why you're seeing that bit of a decline kind of bouncing up and down. It has to do with those wildfires, what's happening that year. Um, and then just um, to note one more note to this. So um, air quality, that program really is a state program and the state is um, just, they don't have necessarily um, a target, but they're making sure that Minnesota is in compliance um, with the federal and the state standards. And um, I think it has on here. Um, the national air quality standards is what they're meeting. Um, now Scott County's role is really, we're taking a look at those um, development review projects that come in, those larger projects that might be a source of air quality um, contamination or pollutants um, and um, looking at their role into the bigger picture of how they might play into um, Minnesota's overall air quality. Thanks, Kate. We are experiencing uh, the fires right now. Um, uh, it's interesting. Um, northern Minnesota's air quality ratings are worse than the metro area right now because of the right? fires. Mm -hmm. That's right, Commissioner. This is a timely uh, discussion because I just heard on the radio on the way in that there's concerns in northern Minnesota with air quality given the wildfires in Canada. So I think this is a data point that we'll continue to want to keep an eye on. I'll be curious to see what the 2020 and ultimately 2021 data point looks like given um, the increasing wildfires happening. So I went in and I had a chance to, I didn't have the actual, the number, but I went in and did, did some data digging and I think 2020 is going to look like about 90%, which is good. Um, but I'm, it, yeah, again, I'm wondering what that 2021, what these wildfires right now, how we're going to do. So. Can, can you talk about where the data is actually derived from? Is there measurements or assessments that are done in Scott County, or is there something in the metro that's assessed that our rating is based on a local of this data? So there are monitors throughout uh, Minnesota, and there happens to be one here in Shakopee. Um, I cannot think, it's on one of the elementary schools here in Shakopee. Thank you. All right, um, maybe let's switch gears. The next set of data slides relate to uh, water transparency. And the, the slide on page uh, nine is a cumulative slide. And then each of those lakes, subsequent um, slides indicate each of those lakes water transparency separately. Um, and so I wonder if we could start by um, talking about just some of the just some of the questions that people who are not scientists see in the in the media, some of the questions that come up, what's the impact of carp, what's the impact of zebra mussels, what's the impact of water treatment? Like what are some of those things other than runoff that might impact water transparency? Can we can someone respond to those questions? Uh, yeah, I can. I'm happy to answer that, Chris. So um, the the first, my first takeaway when I saw this slide was that it's really confusing because you have four separate individuals all being overlapped onto each other. So uh, we did break it down uh, by individual lakes uh, further below, so you could take a picture of each water body. Uh, each water body is as different as you or I, so we're trying to understand what the impacts are overall, um, but by looking at individuals. And, and while this is nice as a summary, it's, it's nearly impossible to read. Um, so one of the things that we look at when we look at water transparency, obviously, is how clear the, the water is. And yes, there are certain things that are well understood. How much sediment is in the water certainly affects uh, the water clarity and the water transparency. Uh, sediment uh, affects the water transparency in a couple of ways. The inputs from the exterior watershed, so the 
sediment being brought in from the surrounding land, but then there's also sediment from internal loading. So there's obviously always sediment in the lakes and how does that get stirred up? Uh, and it does get stirred up by things like carp, um, loss of native vegetation, holding that sediment in place, um, things like um, uh, certain boat usages on certain types of lakes can have negative impacts depending upon if they're not a good fit. So if the lake is too shallow and the boat goes too deep, but that's motor, obviously it can get down there and stir up the sediments on some of those shallow lakes. So there are a lot of things that can affect water transparency. And then we always have things too, like, um, uh, like uh, aquatic invasive species. So you have zebra mussels, which for at least a short time seem to clear the water column. Um, and, and that might indicate something uh, improving when the reality is it might not. Um, a good example of that is Cedar Lake this year has an unusual improvement in water clarity. Uh, so we're actually doing a zooplankton study uh, real quick just to see if that natural population of animal life is actually improving the water quality or if we need to maybe start digging down a little deeper to see if there really are something like zebra mussels on Cedar Lake. And then of course how much phosphorus is in the water too. Uh, that obviously is going to impact how much uh, clarity you see in the water. Melissa, did I miss anything? Um, the only thing that you, you missed is there is a history in Cedar Lake. Um, yeah. And I'll just quickly, and, the, and you probably don't know all of it, but what a lot of people don't know is that Cedar Lake was actually a wetland at one time. If you look back in history on our aerial photos back to 1937, Cedar Lake was actually a, a large wetland. It wasn't until the 1930s when um, President Roosevelt developed the Conservation Corps and uh, a diversion structure was created from Sand Creek, adding water to Cedar Lake and a kind of a makeshift outlet was created at that time also. And then in the 1950s, uh, the DNR put in the outlet that is there today and raised the water level five feet. So historically Cedar Lake has a very rich nutrient sediment in it because it was originally a wetland. Um, so Cedar Lake is gonna take a little bit more time to possibly bring it to a clear water state. Um, so there's a lot more issues going on with Cedar Lake itself. That's why that stands out so much more differently than the rest of the lakes is it's a historically a very nutrient rich um, water body because of the sediment. That's a good addition. Thank you, Melissa. It is something I didn't know. It is not the first uh, lake slash wetland I have encountered though. Um, the last piece I, I always like to remind folks about uh, is that lakes are living systems. They're not static and stuck in time. I know we like to think they are, but they are living systems. They age and grow and die uh, just like the rest of us. Uh, and as they die, obviously they evolve into a wetland state and eventually dry up altogether. Uh, we can do, we can't stop the aging process, but we can slow it down. You know, many things that we do to ourselves to help slow up the aging process or improve the aging process are kind of similar to what we do for our legs. Uh, we reduce the amount of negative things being put into the body. Uh, we try to mediate uh, the negative impacts of the things that are affecting the body. Uh, and uh, depending upon how healthy the lake is really affects how quickly it ages. Uh, but that's always a really important message to communicate to uh, residents and family members and neighbors is that they're not static. They are living systems and they do age. So. So I just am curious, one of the things that I have learned from talking to many of you is that looking at change or progress in environmental science or natural resources really happens over extended periods of time, like change is slow. What, knowing that, what are your programs, like as you're talking to your teams, what are you looking at to know if some of the work you're doing is making a difference or if we're moving forward on improvements or supports for water systems? That is a great question, Chris. So there's, there's kind of a multifaceted answer to that. One of those is that we are required, uh, and we would probably do it anyway, but we do have to have a 10-year management plan that identifies um, the projects that we're going to do, the programs that we're going to do, and our goals for improving the water bodies in the area. And if we implement our plan and achieve those goals and priorities and projects, there will be improvement in water quality because every project we have also assesses how much pollutant reduction will be achieved. 
Uh, and then after that plan is approved, we have to actually annual report to Bowser every single year, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, how we are doing towards meeting that plan, both financially and structurally and program wise. Uh, so we're very data driven and we're very uh, report driven. Um, we're very driven on um, ensuring that the work that we do every year is working towards those long-term goals. Otherwise it would be very difficult uh, at, at just any one point to say, are you effective? Well, if I have to stop right now and decide how effective I am, I have not, I have very little to base that on because my goal is long-term. But if I can add up all those little pieces, that's what gives me that big picture. Uh, the other piece that we're really seeing right now, obviously, is that there's a lot of environmental changes. We have just gotten past the 10 wettest years on record. I know everybody's kind of tired of hearing about it, but it's slightly better than COVID talking about, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, everybody thinks, okay, so we just got done with the 10 wettest years on record. Now we're in the middle of a drought coupled with high humidity, which is causing a lot of our water bodies to evaporate. So we now are literally a year later in the opposite problem. But the bigger picture is really what the standard is, is that we're having more extreme weather events. Gone are the days of this is how our lake or our river is every day. There is no normal anymore. And that's also the expectation we need to try to start communicating to our residents is that there really isn't a norm. The norm is now extremes and it's gonna be a different extreme from year to year. So the projects that we put in, uh, the, the large restoration projects, uh, the volume reduction projects, all of that helps create the stability and the resiliency in our environment. I can't necessarily change extreme weather, but I can build in that capacity on our land and with our residents. So that's kind of more the bigger picture that we're trying to accomplish right now. And that's also the message we're trying to start getting out to our residents is that there is no more norm. There is always extreme. And what can we do to be more stable and more resilient throughout that extreme? And the projects that we do, you'll notice our trends aren't jumping as high as the extremity, as the extreme in nature trends are. Um, our trends are a lot more stable. So you can see the effectiveness of our projects creating that stability in our environment. Chris, I can jump in on this one as well. Um, with it being a science-based programs, uh, We've got data coming out of our ears, and some of that is um, in this packet, um, such as the runoff graph on page 19. Um, in others, um, you know, we're, we're tracking them separate from, um, you know, this packet as well. We've got trend lines from 1990 till 2019 that show sediment and phosphorus uh, being reduced to Sand Creek, um, which you know, is, is a testament to a lot of different things. It, it can be development standards. It can be our programs. Uh, it can be our partners helping out. You know, we we're one entity um, in uh, you know in an effort to um, improve the environment. And so, collaboration is key. Um, it, it's probably um, a, a pretty big factor in it as well. CRP. And I'm sure we all know a neighbor or somebody that, that's brought up that term before. So CRP stands for Conservation Reserve Program. It's a federally funded program and it has implemented a lot of conservation. And um, on page uh, three, it shows all the, the um, conservation projects that we've done um, in just the Sand Creek watershed. And that it's over 2000 uh, since 2006, and that's when the WMOS program started. But, you know, we're working with the Scottish WCD, we're working with Lasur SWCD, Rice SWCD, and any of the federal partners. Um, also on page four, it, it shows other efforts by cities, um, you know, schools uh, that are also doing this. So, you know, um, you know, the proof is kind of in the data, and, and some of it's very encouraging to see that we're we're trending downward, which is good um, on a lot of these, these measures. That's actually a really good point, Ryan. Um, Megan Darley, I'm gonna identify which Megan. <laughs> uh, so Megan works for the SWCD, as, as most of you know, uh, and they're our frontline day-to-day uh, -day contacts with most of our residents. Um, it's, it's one of the best partnerships I've ever seen. 
uh, we really appreciate all their hard work because a lot of the work that they do is building that relationship. Uh, we don't publicly own enough land to make enough of a difference in our water bodies by just putting in projects or practices on public land. Uh, we have to have buy-in from our residents. If our residents aren't doing these things and building a more resilient land for themselves, uh, there's, there's not gonna be any real change. Um, and I was hoping perhaps Megan might talk a little bit about what they've been seeing um, on the front lines when working with residents and putting in projects and practices. Uh, what kind of practices are residents putting in more? Like, are they buying in more now to our projects that are more preventative, the ones that are protecting their land? Uh, not just coming in after they've got a problem with drainage or erosion. Uh, so, Megan? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Vanessa. Um, I've been at the district for about six years now, and since I've worked here, um, it's only been an increase in interest in conservation, um, and I feel like every year, landowners are coming to us wanting to do things voluntarily. We never really have to do a lot of outreach or targeting. Um, people are just hearing about us word from mouth. Um, they appreciate our customer service and they wanna do conservation projects. Um, we've seen a huge surge in people doing cover crops. That's been one of the, the biggest and newest um, conservation practices for providing permanent cover on cropland um, out, outside of the growing season. Um, we've seen a big surge in native prairie restorations, um, especially with all the development going on. When people are purchasing these five to 10 acre lots, they're more interested in having natural vegetation instead of lawns, which is a great indicator of resiliency on our um, private lands. I see a lot with lakeshore restorations, people are more interested in restoring their lakeshore to a more natural state. Um, same thing with stream banks. So we do see a lot more um, proactive, you know, we still work a lot with our farmers that have erosion issues, but more than anything, people are a lot more knowledgeable, especially with pollinators too, I should add that. Um, people are very interested in, in creating pollinator habitat, rain gardens, things like that. So um, we, we don't have to reach too far to find people that are interested in our conservation practices and um, everything's voluntary and they're, they're excited about doing them. So it's a very enjoyable job to have when you have great residents that are interested in that. So, yeah. The question I wanted to ask about cedar, um, I can remember saying, uh, let's get regressive with cedar before it becomes a regional park. And so some of my comments were certainly more than 15 years ago. Um, and maybe, maybe several years further back than that. Uh, and, you know, I was told back then, well, it'll take time, it'll take time. But now we're bearing down, on, I don't know if we're bearing down in 20 years, it's taken time and we're seeing bad numbers. And, and um, I'm just curious what to think about that. I mean, a lot's been done at Cedar. I mean, they've treated it, they've removed the septics, you know, they've stored water around the lake. And I, mean, I understand it's a shallow lake and, and, uh, and all that stuff. But um, if we have 15 years a week, you know, don't see success or what should we be expecting with, I, I guess I felt back then, I feel now that we ought to give a little extra special attention to our recreational lakes that are in regional parks um, or rec they don't have to be in regional parks, but those especially. Remember Clary at one time was ranked as the dirtiest lake in the metro area. Um, uh, they had used to, I don't know if they still, they used to have to flood up the spring water to, uh, to make it smooth, you know, so, uh, and they've, they've done twice, they've done, uh, drained it, emptied it to get rid of early leaf pondweed, if I'm saying that right. Um, but anyhow, I, I guess, what should residents think or commissioners think if we keep on saying it takes time and 20 years go by and we're still there? Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, can I add on to your question yeah. so we can respond? Um, I think it's a good question, and um, I would love in response if, if we can talk a little bit about um, what is success, because success is probably made, uh, measured a little bit differently by, by us at this table, by people live around the lake, by um, people concerned more about recreation, people concerned more about fishing. So if you could speak to that too, I think some of these statistics 
can be a little bit misleading that way, that we think one way is success, but that's only success for some people. So I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts about that. So that's a great uh, question. Um, the absolutely valid, we get it all the time, not just here, but obviously statewide. Um, as I kind of started out earlier in, in saying each, each lake is different. Uh, Cedar is, is no more unique than everybody else, but it is especially unique in that the magnitude of the problems, the magnitude of the issues are at a very significant. Uh, we do have a, a total maximum daily load report for Cedar, uh, and you look at what it will take to bring Cedar into state standards, and it is significant, um, far more than just about most of our other lakes. So part of it is magnitude of problems, right? Um, you know, my husband can eat, you know, one less cookie a week, and uh, he'll easily lose 10 pounds. I'll cut out sugar, run a 5K, and I'm lucky if I lose a half a pound. Uh, you know, magnitude and, and water body unique characteristics really have an impact here. Uh, and so it's going to be smaller, right? You're not going to see big changes in, in what seemed like a large period of time. Um, as far as, you know, see they're like not getting better, as, you know, Chris pointed out, better depends on who you're looking at. Um, overall, I think the, the one of the strongest things I, I'd like to point out is that um, as far as the decreases, uh, Cedar has been holding its own. So we're, the decreases are minimal. So a lot of the work that we're doing right now is just to try to stabilize these environments in these extreme weather years. So you're right, over the last 10, 20 years, um, it, it hasn't made a significant jump in improvements, but at the same time, we have not also significantly lost too much ground on this lake. Uh, and considering what we're dealing with, it's a pretty notable uh, success. Uh, as I mentioned earlier too, uh, the water clarity in Cedar is uniquely better right now. Um, we're kind of trying to understand where that's coming from. We don't want to get our hopes up. Um, Cedar has had a few populations of uh, really unique natives starting to come back, which is also a signal of, uh, of a healthier lake. So native plant vegetation is your foundation uh, for a healthy lake community. So, you know, I can't convince any resident necessarily that these small things are going to make them feel better, um, but they they do matter and they are they are signs of improvement and of change, um, and also signs that you know we're at least holding our own with cedar right now. Which if we did nothing and we had done nothing, uh, it's it's quite easily apparent that cedar would be far far worse than it already is. Um, Melissa, a couple other thoughts you might have. Uh, this is something you've endured. We talk about it pretty much every day of every week. Because uh, uh, and we care about cedar. I mean, we we love cedar. It's not like it's just a number to us. So, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah. So, to measure success, we you know we can look at the data, but we we've also kind of measured success with just responses from. Um, the citizens around the lake. I can tell you that the years that we have done whole lake treatments for curly leaf, we've had great responses from the residents um, that are putting money into the lake as well through the Lake Improvement District. And those years were 2015, 2016, 2019, and 2020. They were just ecstatic on how great the lake to look. And that's because we did whole lake treatments for curly leaf. Now, I know we've been at curly leaf treatments for almost 10 years now. And um, some lakes, you can take care of it within five years. Some lakes take a lot longer. What we have to understand is that curly leaf has been growing in Cedar Lake for decades before we even started treating for it. So there's a huge seed bank at the bottom of the lake. And it was our understanding that when we created the implementation plan for Cedar Lake, that there was decades of a seed bank there. And it was that we would target curly leaf and keep treating it year after year in hopes that when we did kill it off, the next year would be those seeds at the bottom sprouting and we weren't creating new seeds. 
we didn't have enough money every single year to treat the whole lake. So it's, you know, <clears throat> it's still going to take time to keep treating the lake and keep, uh, you know, those, that seed bank re-sprouting until we get to a point where um, the density is just reduced to a point that we can just spot treat for it. And curly leaf does add phosphorus to the water column once it dies off around the 4th of July. So that is a water quality issue. Um, we did talk with residents back before we created the implementation plan on what strategies we were going to use to get to a clear water state with cedar because that's what the residents told us they wanted. We want a clear water state. We went through, you know, we could dredge the lake and, and take out that, you know, nutrient rich sediment, but that's going to cost up to $600 million and nobody wanted, you know, that was too much money. And we did talk about doing a lake drawdown. Um, to try to freeze out the curly leaf and kill off the rough fresh. And nobody wanted, you know, nobody around the lake wanted to do that and feared that the lake wouldn't fill back up again. So we did present other options, other management options. And this is what the lake residents were comfortable with is working on the curly leaf, working on the rough fish, monitoring the water quality and see where progress takes us. Um, there are a few other external issues coming into the lake that we haven't been able to address yet. Um, and, and we're still working with landowners to be able to address those because it's a voluntary um, issue, but Cedar Lake is unique. It's definitely different from some of the other lakes that we have. And um, it's, you know, it's definitely gonna take more time, but it seems like the lake residents are still invested and still wanna keep contributing money towards those improvements. Yep, that, that partnership and that relationship is key. And you are right. Um, we look at the lake itself, but sometimes we diverge from the people living on the lake. So while they are frustrated um, at times, they're also very supportive and we get far more positive emails uh, than ever negative emails. And even the negative emails, it's like, oh, geez, you know, this is a real issue this year, uh, but we know you care and we know that we can come to you and work with you to come up with a plan as to what to do next. So that partnership may not be tangible, but it, it, is, it is there. Commissioners, did you get answers to your questions? Or do you have follow-ups? Did those, those responses to your questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to know what to think. I mean, I'm not, answers. I, I uh, want a little more information. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, Chris, thank you. Um, I did not know that Cedar Lake was sort of a manufactured lake. Uh, and um, damn, I'm grateful to learn that kind of thing because, you know, I fly over every once in a while and I see the green stuff growing in around the edges. And in the wintertime, they they're always aerating the lake to try to keep the oxygen levels up. Um, and that explains a few things. Um, I think of a couple of them in Shakopee too, that uh, when we first moved here in 1985, uh, 86, it was hot, it was dry. Uh, I'd love to see the rainfall and particularly dew point maps um, from that era. Because when we moved to town in our neighborhood, the raging debate was uh, Dean's Lake is dry. Uh, actually, it was deemed swamp. It became a lake whenever the neighbors moved around it and decided it was a lake. Uh, and there was a actually a political movement afoot that forced the Sheely gravel pit to pump their water back over and into Prior Lake because Prior Lake was so low, people were tearing their props up on the rocks. That's how dry it was in that season and hot. Uh, and of course, the hope was they could pump enough Sheely gravel water into Prior Lake to make the ditch run again so that. Dean's Lake could get some water in it and uh, it become a lake again. Uh, I say all that just say um, it, it appears that these things kind of move through cycles and um, that we uh, try to affect our natural environment with some built things uh, like create Cedar Lake or like make Dean's Swamp into Dean's Lake or things like that. Um, you just got to know this commissioner is okay with that, but just so we talk it through and we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, particularly like with the Cedar Lake issue, um, it's great that people want to live on the lake and that they've taken that marsh and turned it into something useful for recreation and sport fishing and 
wildlife and things like that. Um, but it's good that we know what we're up against here. We're up against Mother Nature and it might cost a lot of dollars to bend the curve on what made Mother Nature started. Um, and we should just know that with our eyes wide open going in. It also helps when we look at some of these, what look like at first glance, scary bar graphs. Look how, look how murky Cedar Lake is. Well, there's a story behind that. And it helps us understand the rest of the story. So thank you for putting the graphs together like that. I guess I say all that to say this. Um, I'm good with affecting the natural environment when it makes it better for humans and wildlife around it. And uh, But we just need to know the cost and the, and the the downstream effects, I guess, if I can point upon. That's funny. Good Thank presentation. You. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's move ahead to page 15. As long as we're talking about bad stuff in the water. Um, let's talk about the slide about arsenic tests uh, by year. So in 2019, there was a scene article. Uh, that encouraged people to do testing. And we saw this pretty significant increase in uh, the number of tests that were completed as a result of that. What's interesting to me about that is just how big of an impact that that article seems to have had in the year, uh, but also what a, a high rate of uh, tests that were over standard. So can someone talk to uh, uh, those kind of few points of uh, why was that article so effective? Um, and with the almost, well, it looks like over 30% of uh, tests were over standard. Uh, what did we do with those results and how did that improve lives? And then uh, the follow-up to that is, should we be doing more outreach uh, to try and get those tests up every year? So there's about five questions for you. Who wants that? Hi, hi Scott, this is Kate. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this one since uh... Um, I was part of um, putting out that scene article. So um, just, just a little background here. So um, there's two things that are happening here. So there's lots of times that we're testing um, what's in the groundwater um, as an indicator of what's going on in the surface, on the surface water, or we're looking for, um, do we have um, source pollution going on? Uh, maybe it's um, pesticides or fertilizer. Um, in, in ag communities that we'd be looking for. But there's also another thing that we do here in environmental services is we're looking at um, public safety. And we kind of take, you know, we, we are, we stay in touch with the MPCA and the Department of Health. And um, we kind of take some cues from them when they say, hey, this is a, an emerging issue or a concern that we have found through research that you county should be aware of. So what happened in, um, prior to 2019 is that the Department of Health and the MPCA were taking a look at arsenic and they were finding that that's something that naturally occurs in um, groundwater. Um, so they weren't saying there's something out there that we need to be looking for, but this is naturally occurring and they're finding this. Counties, please be aware. And so what we did is we put out a scene article um, in 2019 we, and we typically do, we, we put out scene articles um, probably two or three a year um, that remind folks in, in the rural areas that are on individual wells to test their wells. And we often tell them to test for nitrate and fecal, which are indicator, um, indicators. But this time we sent out, said, okay, you know, everyone remember that if you're on an individual well, you should be regularly testing your well. And by the way, um, you should test for arsenic because it could be in, in the water. Um, and we just got a flood of people that year um, concerned that arsenic was in their water. They tested it and guess what? Scott County has arsenic in their water. Um, so when we put that article out, we knew that we could and have that in, in here in Scott County. And now that we do, we had to take a moment and kind of, plan and, and what's our next steps? What are we going to do? So we were going to continue to um, monitor this and get the information out to folks to test for this um, in 2020. And what we were going to do was, um, we had learned some things in 19 when we put that scene article out. Um, 
which kind of came flooding in and it was too much um, for staff to handle for them all to come in once. It was uh, the Minnesota Valley Testing Lab is our lab. And they said, wait, we, we, we can't take, you know, 100 samples at one time. Um, we got to spread this out. So we said, okay, what we'll do in 2020 is we'll um, try to take an approach where we're only um, doing, um, kind of getting this message out three Three or four count, three or four townships at a time. We'll do like a postcard concept where we'll put something in the mail and say, um, you, "You should be testing your well, um, and here's what you might want to consider testing for arsenic." Well, then um, in March, um, the courthouse closed the doors, and we can no longer offer that service for people to come in and buy the test or to drop off their kit. So we had to modify what we were doing. Um, and we decided it would not be a good idea to send out um, these targeted postcards. Um, we just stayed with our um, standard um, see an article of information, please come in and test for your it, normal indicators and arsenic. So that's why the number went down in 2020. And we're hoping here in 2021 that we will maybe get back to that um, idea to kind of target a few townships at a time. Um, it might be more of a 21, 22 project. Can I ask a kind of a related question about this? So um, many of us have been involved in conversations about the A or the ARPA funding. Danny did a presentation a few weeks ago. There was a lot of emphasis in that. Uh, legislation about lead pipes and lead in the water and, and funding for mitigation strategies. Can someone talk about what's the status of lead here? Do we know how many homes have lead pipes? Uh, is there a way to get a scope of what that means for Scott County? I can jump in on that one, Chris. That's a, been a question that we've been looking at as well since um, our discussions on ARPA funds. We're not aware of any cities in the county that have widespread uh, lead pipe issues within their public um, system. Um, we're still looking into that, but we haven't uncovered anything yet at, at a municipal level. So we're now kind of looking more at the private distribution lines running from the street or, or well into the homes. And um, one indicator that we've seen is that any home built before 1986 may have um, lead pipes, it's not a guarantee, but it's a, it's, a, it's a probability. So if you just look at the number of homes built before 1986 in the county, I think we ran the, the data and it looks like there's about 11,000 homes here, about 20, I think it was about 25% of our housing stock was built before 1986. So that gives you kind of a, a scale and then um, we've uh, mapped those homes just to see generally where they're located. And they're where you would expect um, when you think about our communities, primarily some of the neighborhoods around our downtowns, um, some of the homes in the Eastern townships that are in the 1960s and 70s models, and then a lot of the scattered, scattered uh, farmsteads and homesteads. Um, so we've got a kind of a scale of the number of homes and the location. Um, and that's just the starting point. That's about where we're at. And we're thinking about um, what additional analysis we want to do to get maybe more definitive information on, on where there could be some issues with lead pipes. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, Brian. So the one piece that, that I like to stress to that is uh, when you talk about funding for water resources as it relates to surface and natural resources, uh, we can get funding for things that are connected to those surface water resources. So this is why nitrates and arsenic are, are things that we have access to funding for. But things that are infrastructure based, that are pipe based, uh, are, are not things that we have access to funding for. So when you talk about these new sources of funding, um, it may be one of those few opportunities you have. Um, like Kate likes to say, it's more of a public health 
rather than an, a natural resource area of opportunity. Okay, thank you. Let's go one page ahead. So here we're looking at the annual precipitation uh, trend line, uh, which is kind of funny to, to look at right now since we're talking about drought and we saw 2020 seemed a little bit lower uh, as well. Um, so my question is, as we look at these, you know, eight of the last 10 years on this chart that was above that trend line, you know, how do we look at infrastructure now and in the future and try and appropriately scale that infrastructure based on uh, these continued experiences of this, uh, um, and precipitation? And then um, how do we then go backwards and look at things like culverts that were done many years ago and uh, determine if they're sufficient to uh, keep up or if we need to go back and make improvements to those structures as well? That's a very good question. It, it is uh, stormwater and surface water infrastructure um, is a large part specifically of like what municipalities and, and agencies that operate infrastructure system do on a day-to-day -day basis. The vast majority of their budgets are simply towards maintenance and repair of those systems. So where like the WMO might come in are those larger funding projects and coordinated projects that might cross those political boundaries to create new storage upstream and uh, reduce the amount of volume and reduce the rate um, and peak flows. Uh, that's kind of a little bit more of kind of the WMOs uh, and on all WDs, WMOs, that's kind of their purpose, right, is those larger scale projects that can benefit multiple resources and multiple agencies to help ease some of the burden on their existing infrastructure. When you look at existing infrastructure, there's a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, we do update our um, development standards on um we look at them every year, but generally I'd say mostly every five years when the new NPDES permit comes out, um, that takes into account the last 10 years generally of rainfall and, and how you should be sizing your infrastructure to accommodate that. Uh, so that's how we address the moving forward. Now, obviously that being said, that's even still almost always a little bit outdated. Uh, but for example, 10 years ago, we were capturing the first five inches. These days, you know, people are starting to push 1.1 inch to the first two inches of rainfall. Um, the last piece of course is, well, what do you do with this aging infrastructure? Uh, well, when you need to repair or replace it, you kind of have to look at replacing it for at least meeting the current standards. Pretty much everybody knows if you're meeting the current standards, you might already be outdated in five years. But when it comes to budgets, uh, most municipalities um, and agencies that operate public works and counties, you're not going to be able to fund a pro uh, infrastructure project that has the capacity to take into account a rainfall for the next 500 year event or into the future. You're, you're trying to just build for what we've got now. Um, Megan Tasca uh, does most of our development review now and works with obviously most of our stormwater infrastructure. Um, Megan, um, do you have any thoughts as to kind of what we're doing right now and what you're seeing right now in the county um, as to how to accommodate, you know, aging culverts and the aging drainage systems and storm infrastructure to um, adapt to our current precipitation issues? Yeah. Um, with everything that's being designed, you know, there, there is a certain level of risk that you, you do take, you know, because you can't design for every storm event that's possible out there. Um, you know, new development that's coming in is, is doing a great job with meeting our current standards. Um, our highway infrastructure, you know, we do have some older stuff out there that we do try and update and, and, and stuff for rainfalls, um, but it's hard. It's it's a big job. It's, you know, yes, rainfall keeps going up. Um, it's a lot of these intense flash flood kind of events that, that our infrastructure isn't really sized to handle that cause the problems. But, 
you know, you have to, you have to do a risk analysis and, and determine what, what you can plan for. Megan, I know a few years ago, we changed some of our runoff rate standards because we, we would look at past precipitation rates. Mm -hmm. Can you t just talk a little bit more about that and what it's meant to the impact of developers? Sure. Um, yep. Um, it, uh, five, 10 years ago now, the, um, the federal government did some studies on precipitation amounts and, and rates and um, the amount of rainfall for, for the storm events that we do design for did increase for the county. For, for example, a 100 year storm event used to be a, a six inch rainfall over 24 hours and now it's about 7.2 inches over 24 hours. Um, so when those standards came out, you know, we did adopt those. And so yes, uh, infrastructure is getting bigger to accommodate the increase in rainfall that is that is from that. Hey, can I ask one quick question? So this graph goes back to 1990. If we went backwards three or four or five more years, what where would that start? Because those three or four years were probably the three driest years of the whole last 40 years, right? Oh, yeah. 87 was very dry, except for one day, like July 11th, 87, because like Inches, but that was localized. But that was localized, and it was dry after that. Then '88 was very dry, and then '89, uh, Hanrahan Lake over there. I walked across that. It was, it was dry. So I don't know. So you want to see a graph? I'd just like to see, you know, because this is actually gives me a little bit of hope that we're going to come out of the drought here pretty soon. <laughs> so I don't have to water my garden. I didn't know. <laughs> Anyhow. Anyhow. So that's the this would be very good. Um, Chris, yes. A question about the, uh, the statistics you're working with, and I'm just going to give you a little background of where I'm coming from with the comment. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the mountains, Pennsylvania, we had a flood control dam built. In fact, the federal government <clears throat> was on a program in the 50s and 60s of saving saving us from these mega storms by building. Flood control dams that flooded entire valleys, and they talked about the millions of acre feet they could hold back uh, to save the downstream downstream towns from being washed away, which happened with alarming regularity at the time. But um, it's somewhere in the 60s, 70s, the entire focus changed from these mega dam projects to wait a minute when people develop property, let's let them put or require them to put some storm ponding on their development. And in effect, we created hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of small flood control projects instead of a few huge mega projects that the federal government came by and built. So uh, as I'm watching these small ponds and big ponds in some cases develop, and I know that's a requirement that seems to be, you would think it would yield some success, but somebody somewhere must have the number of how many acre feet of small ponds we have on private property because we changed the building codes. You follow me? It'd be nice to see where that trend has been going as projects have been redeveloped or new shopping centers built or parks or what have you. <coughs> Excuse me. And we, and we require private property owners to hold back a large portion of their runoff from an, an event that we've established the standard for. It would just be helpful to know how that project is working vis-a-vis -vis major flood control projects. I have a hunch it's probably significant, but it could be a little victory story you could tell on the impact that those things have had. So it's not really a question, it's a, it's a comment or observation that might be helpful as you're putting this together. The second one has to do with dew points, because any of us that have taken meteorology one one know that dew points are actually the fuel that, that drives rainfall precipitation. And um, besides the fact we've got changing weather patterns that are scooping more moisture from the Gulf and sending it up here and so on and so forth, there's two other observations that I think have had a huge impact and I haven't seen anybody make a case about it. But one is center point irrigation over the last 30 or 40 years. Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, we pump water out of the aquifer and put it on the top of the ground like crazy. The second one is corn and corn production. There's no plant on God's earth that transpires as much water into the atmosphere as a corn stalk. 
And I used to know the numbers off the top of my head, but it is a significant amount of water, gallons per day, that each corn stalk transpires. And not only now have we moved rows closer together and stalks closer together, we're growing almost twice as much corn as we did back in the 70s and 80s. What has that done to our dew points? And has anybody figured out how that's impacted uh, localized climate patterns and rainfall amounts? I have a hunch it's probably pretty significant and probably beyond the scope of today's presentation. Just know that inquiring minds think about these things. You know, we'll put that on the list for the next time these folks are back. That's all. I can hardly wait. Thank Good. you. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right. Uh, I want to just note that we are we are bumping up against our timeline here. So I'd like to give the commissioners any last chance to ask any additional questions. We appreciate your conversation as we've gone through the presentation. Um, if you have other comments or questions, we'll end with that. I would just make one, Mr. Chair. Um, Cedar Lake, that lake used to actually be a farm. I mean, it's actually, it was not just a swamp, it's a farm. It's farm hay and stuff on it. I've heard from numerous people. So, and a lot of these, like, I don't know about Murphy Hammerheads, but boy, those are awful shallow. At some point, they may disappear because in some parts of them are disappearing because they're filling in with vegetation. It just it dies and. Anyhow, that was a comment. Mr. Sheriff, I may. Go ahead. Um, yeah, the, uh, that was very enlightening that Cedar Lake was not a lake. But let's keep it down. Minnesota's got a reservoir. Shh. Let's, yeah. keep let's keep that part down. Um, I'm, I'm stuck on page 15 um, with those arsenic tests. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I'm, am I remembering this correctly? That it, maybe it was in 19, whenever you guys uh, were last year, there was a map of areas of the county that had wells that were known, must have been at that time, that had higher, and they were like these weird pockets. Um, and not necessarily all over the place, but I also see that our numbers are very low for these years. Do we have an idea on the 19? Is that following the same trend or is it starting a new one? I'm kind of curious about that. I, mean, I, I think that's the part of Scott's question and answer. What does that green mean? I mean, is it not drinkable? Is it washable? Is it usable? Are there mitigations? What are those tests telling us? Where are they? Oh, okay, Com Commissioner Beard, this is Kate. I can, I can speak to that. So um, once we got those um, kits, those results back, um, I, know them, I, know, I know what you're referring to. We mapped that to see if we could figure out what the trend is um, where that was coming from and it seemed like the highest density was around um cedar lake um the cedar uh, uh the cedar lake township in in sort of that enter that area sort of the center lower uh, southern center scott county and what we need to do and so we went and did some research um is it um that the particular wells were all pulling from the same aquifer um is it, you know, what, what was it that those wells had in common? That's what we were researching at the time. And we were working with um, the Minnesota uh, Geological Survey, um, who is interested in arsenic. Um, and they're thinking that it is, um, it's coming from the, you know, um, aquifers that have a till in them. So we are working on that. But what we would like to do is continue to ask more people in the county to test to see um, sort of kind of proving our, our concept of model, you know, why, why it is where it is. Um, is it the depth of the well of the aquifer or, or is it a susceptibility? Um, we're still working on that and we just need more folks to, to volunteer to test. But I know the map you're talking about, we kind of have an idea of what area and it might be a depth issue too. Kate, is it only in that area? Like today, is arsenic present in those areas primarily, or is it more widely spread? I think we're going to find it's more widely spread that it's an aquifer that folks are pulling from. Um, so let's just take um, probably 15 years ago, we did something similar with nitrate, and we found that nitrate was higher in kind of a, a pocket of area in Credit River. And it's because those folks had, um, they were in the uh, sand and gravel. That's the where the water that they were pulling from was from a sand and gravel aquifer. Um, that's no longer the issue. They don't have high nitrates in that area. They do still need to be aware of that because um, sand and gravel, um, things can filtrate through that pretty quickly. 
Um, so we're still working on where it is in Scott County and those that need to be uh, testing for it. But the good news is that there is treatment. So it's a matter of reaching out to these folks, letting them know, please test your well for arsenic. There are There is treatment that you can do to, re to lower the number um, and make that water safe to drink. Um, and I think right now we would just say anyone that's on a drinking well should come in and test um, until we get a better idea of those that are maybe at a higher risk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah that's helpful. I just want to make sure I was remembering that right. And then if there is a trend that, you know, that they're at least aware of it. I guess yeah, we, we're starting to see a trend and yeah. Um, my last comment is um, you could maybe infer by some comments that, you know, maybe there's a question of uh, uh, global warming versus climate change. And that's above my pay grade. It's above my pay grade. Um, I don't worry too much about either one of those. Not to say I don't worry about it. I do believe in the bigger picture of being a good steward of all things. So my comment is it's very easy to follow a path when you're hearing about things often. Just the human nature of it is just, oh, take a drug down that. Um, so being a good steward is, is important to me, but, um, but asking ourselves good questions and commissioner beard brought up a, a very good point of corn sweat. I mean, evapotranspiration is a, is a real thing, um, to make sure that we're looking at everything holistically when we're making determinations of, is this working? Is it is 20 years too long? Is it too short? Um, so I just wanted to add my comment that I, I don't know which one is right. Global warming climate change, neither one, either. I, I don't know, but being a good stewardship with open eyes and open mind and, and um, truth is important that we make good decisions looking at everything holistically. So not a question, just a comment. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Any more comments? Yeah, I do. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. Just on the arsenic discussion, I think that is important and I'd love uh, for us to continue to, whether it be seen, social media, educate people about what they can do if their arsenic tests um, come out too high, if their nitrate tests come out too high. I think that's really a core function. We can help with the testing and then tell them how to how they can take action for themselves. Um, I, I just, I, I think that's really important. Um, as another topic we didn't quite get to, but septic system compliance, very important, very important in District 1 especially. And I applaud staff for continuing to work on that issue, to work with um, homeowners and landowners to make sure their systems are in compliance. I know each year we use all of the grants allocated from the state to help folks, the loans, uh, because that is a big, it's a big expense. It's a difficult thing for a family. So uh, again, just you know, hate to not to highlight septic systems during this discussion too. Um, great packet, great presentation. I appreciated the, um, and I know it took some work, so I just want to call out the um, the fact sheets about the different projects, and that uh, that illustrates something that is just so important to me. We've heard several times throughout this presentation. And from my, my chair here, I hope we want to continue. And that's that landowner participation and buy-in. So very important. That's how we hope to work in Scott County all over. But this is a great example of it. So um, I, I'd love if we could highlight that more and share that more. Um, and, and it's, I think, for a lot of us at this table, that partnership and participation is, is important. So I hope we continue doing that. Um, Oh, I think we've talked a little bit um, this year and about Odawa specifically, but it makes sense for all our lakes. I, I like the idea and I think it was yours. Gosh, now I think I think it was Vanessa, not Megan, but it was one of you wonderful ladies about lake pages um, that we can have on our county website to really help communicate with and educate our residents who are around the lake to give them that information, that truth, as Mr. Um, Beer said, to really have a resource there. Um, because it is important. Those lakes are important to our residents and to our quality of life here. So really great things that you've all been working on and just wanted to highlight some of the ones that I'm, I'm probably most excited about and hope we continue to um, further. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Those uh, lake pages are something that I've done at, at previous agencies and they were very well received by residents. 
So we will get definitely working on those with the, the updated website. Um, also, thank you for noting the, the CIP fact sheets. So while the, the KPIs are, are great indicators, um, the one thing I did notice is that uh, we didn't really do much to highlight in our KPIs um, our capital projects and our technical assistance cost share projects. And that's 72% of our budget. You know, we spend over a million dollars a year on capital projects and technical assistance projects, uh, but we didn't really have a good KPI for that. And the partnerships that come out of that with the agencies and the residents. Um, so it was intentional to kind of hopefully bring the conversation that way a little bit. So thank you for noticing. Other questions or comments? Last comment. Go ahead. Sure. And, and just uh, to the whole team, um, you know, uh, uh, one of the things I appreciated about your predecessor, Paul, is he always imparted this sense of calmness and common sense, uh, common senseness, I guess, when it came to the, in, the environmental questions that we're dealing with and we're kind of watching out for. Well, Paul's retired, he's gone. But uh, I just want you to know I sensed the same tone in your presentation this morning. Uh, here's your work, uh, here's the common sense approach, and uh, we're just going about uh, doing the right thing. And I, uh, it was noted and it's appreciated, thank you. Thank All you. right, uh, you know what, you need to advise us, uh, I think, uh, how you want these to go, because I, I kind of feel like we maybe asked so many questions up front, I did, mm -hmm. that we didn't get to some of the stuff, some of the great stories that you maybe wanted to tell. And, and so, uh, I don't know if we need to give more time or manage your time better because, I mean, there's a lot of good, great work here that the public sure is. isn't seeing and uh, we're not discussing. Or, or, so uh, guide us on how you like the time to do things. Um, hmm? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Want us to let ourselves? Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I, but no, anyhow, it's a very good point. Oh, very good that? point. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right. I would encourage uh, my colleagues, if you haven't, uh, to check with staff. You can always go see some of these capital projects. They are good. They are impressive. Um, I've, I've um, seen a couple of them with staff sometimes without. Um, I wear my, have my safety vest and my car, so I always look like I'm there on official business. Um, well, you know, pre-COVID, Paul used to take us on field trips and feed us cookies. Yeah. Of course, the trip itself was uh, 